Good morning. Uh, very, very pleased to be here. Thank you for that introduction. My topic is chemical risk assessment. Uh, I'm going to give you a fairly high-level view of it so you can look at the content of risk assessment uh, because that's the, the essence of the, of the process is what I want to convey to you, not the fine details. That'll give us, I think, room to discuss the similarities and differences with microbial assessments. I will say that chemical risk assessment is a very, very big worldwide enterprise. There are thousands of chemical assessments done every year, most not very good, some quite good, uh, and, and, but, but there's a large effort to try to improve the assessment process uh, all the time. There are thousands and thousands of chemicals in commerce that need some assessment. So what I'm going to cover here, uh, as I said, is a high level and actually kind of a simplistic view because almost all of those assessments appear with controversy. There is enormous scientific controversy associated with almost all of them. Uh, you got a hint of it if you were at the last session on pizza and pizza boxes and uh, the possible chemical issues with pizza boxes. But the controversies that you got a hint of there abound in this field. So you're going to see a much sort of simplified version of what happens in this process. I'm going to talk about not just the technical aspect of the assessment, because to do assessments well and to use them well, uh, you need to understand more about the context in which they developed some of the underlying foundations and principles that I will also try to convey. And I'm also going to talk about decisions, because the use of these assessments is, these assessments are only done to make decisions. There's no other reason for them. You, so you need to understand the decision context a bit. They go back, uh, chemical assessments, back to the 30s when people got interested in the first time in figuring out how to make sure when people are exposed to chemicals, whether in the workplace, in food, or in air, or water, that they're not going to be harmed. And so you see some early efforts back as early as 1930 to come up with some kind of systematic way to do this, but nothing very clear emerged. The first major step forward came in the uh, early 1950s with a bunch of FDA scientists who first formulated some fairly systematic approaches to dealing with uh, chemical toxicity. Uh, all of this, in all of this time and for many years after this, the issue of chemical carcinogens was avoided by most people. They were, they, they were thought to have very special forms of risk that you needed, uh, and no one had a real good approach to them. Uh, the 70s were an important era for all of this kind of coming together in new ways. Lots of new federal laws in the US. EPA was founded. OSHA was founded. Lots of new data on toxicity and carcinogenicity appearing at great rates. The chemists were going crazy finding lower and lower levels of everything in the environment. Um, so. Uh, this was a major era. It was quite an era of considerable turmoil in this world that we're talking about, because a lot of uncertainty about what to do about it all. The, the, the real foundation for what we do now was laid by the National Academy of Sciences uh, in a study uh, sponsored by all the major federal agencies uh, and, the, and a report produced that sort of laid the foundations and principles we still live by in a lot of the actual practice of risk assessment. It produced a report, uh, risk assessment in the federal government, a very, very important report. And what you see from that first report in 1983, it's shown here on the left of this, uh, this is the 1983 report, a very small book, which is 70% pretty dull reading, but the other 30% is dynamite. It's very, very good and was quite informative and sort of set the stage for many others. These are just a couple of other reports. I mentioned the 2009 report from the NAS that talks very much about putting the risk assessment process in the proper decision context even before you embark on risk assessment. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. That's very, very important because risk assessments need to be useful for decisions. And you can put scientists to work doing risk assessments, and without that context, they will just work forever having fun, but without really producing something useful. Uh, uncertainty, this is a report that came out in 13. I'll talk a little bit about uncertainty, which is the great, which is the subject we all like to ignore. 
uh, and we need to do much more on that topic. And there are, there are literally dozens of other reports you can consult from the Academy on this topic. Here, here are some key lessons from the Academy. Scientifically rigorous and useful for decisions. That's, those are sort of key elements of any risk assessment process. They're guided by the needs of risk managers, those who are in policy positions, but the managers should not be interfering with the assessment process. It's, it is a scientific enterprise, but even though it is a scientific enterprise, note number three here, you cannot complete most risk assessments without making some assumptions which do not have complete scientific uh, validation. It's, it's inevitable, that's the state of the science. So, but, so to complete assessments, you need to make assumptions, and what those assumptions should be is always a matter of debate. The, the NAS always recommended, step number four here, that guidelines should exist which describe how you do the assessment process and what the key assumptions are. EPA has been very, very good at writing guidelines about all of this. Uh, that's, that they're a, a very excellent uh, example. Even though lots of them fall out of date over time, they're very hard to keep up. But that's why to make the process clear and explicit you understand and transparent, uh, you need to follow those guidelines. You don't make up the assumptions as you go, is sort of what way, a way to look at it. Here is the key element laid out in the initial red book. Uh, you've got tons of data, research data, on toxic properties of chemicals, or any environmental agent. It could be chemical, physical, biological. You've got information on exposures, but, but it's often complicated and, and many times the information has lots of inconsistencies in it. You've got to do an analysis. You can't just re run from the research data to some decisions about protecting human health without some analysis in between. Uh, I wanted to go back. Yeah, so that, that analysis has come to be called risk assessment, which I'll talk a little bit more about here. Central to all of this is being able to talk about all of this in clear and useful ways. The subject of risk communication comes up here, and again, as with uncertainty, it's a pretty, uh, it's, uh, it's not a, a not well-developed uh, uh, topic. Um, what was I doing? Okay. This is the standard four-step framework for risk assessment. I think most of you have seen this in many other contexts. It talks about looking in step one, what are, the, what are the harmful effects of a chemical or other agent? We call those hazards. What the evidence to support that is analyzed. How does the rate of occurrence of the hazard, the risk, change with dose, step two? What is the human exposure or human dose, step three? You put that together, what's the risk? What are the uncertainties? So that logic is pretty simple. But it, and it's important to follow that logic and thinking through the process. Um, it's based on the fact that all chemical agents, all chemical agents, with almost no exceptions, will cause some kind of harmful effect at sufficient doses. That's sort of a principle. So the world does not divide into toxic chemicals and non-toxic chemicals. That's a simplification. It, but it does divide into risky chemicals and those that are not. So that's an important distinction to keep in mind. We call the toxic properties of a chemical a hazard, and uh, we want to identify doses at which the hazards are unlikely to be expressed. Step number four, we don't mean that they're not going to be expressed, but unlikely. And so we call those safe doses, and that's kind of the, process, that's kind of the thinking that derives a risk-based decision designed to, to protect people, protect public health. Uh, this is one of the big differences, I think, that comes out in uh, microbial and chemical risk assessments is the sources of evidence used for chemical assessments. Uh, hazard information, I li list here both toxicology and epidemiology studies. Most of what we rely upon comes from toxicology studies in animals. We rely upon it and I'll go into that in a little bit. Same thing for dose response information and then information on human exposure. Uh, there is epidemiologic evidence, but it's hard to get for chemicals, particularly with respect to chronic diseases, which, we, which are of most interest. We, we, we can do investigations in exposed humans, but those are all, we are restricted to doing observational studies, uh, not 
not any deliberate exposure studies. That should be obvious. We don't do clinical trials to test toxicity. But we can do, get information from observational studies. They're often workplace studies, air pollution studies, and they are very difficult to do and even more difficult from them to get conclusive answers about causation. So although they have an important role, most evidence that we rely upon for chemical assessments is from experimental studies in animals, and as I'll say later, from even from more uh, uh, in vitro studies are becoming more and more important in that area. So this is one area where there's a, there's a fair difference, I think, in the two areas. There's a lot of assumptions uh, involved in using animal data. No, no one is really happy to do that. Uh, there's a lot of questions about even using animals in tests like this. Uh, we're trying to solve those problems, but we, we assume the animal results are relevant to humans even if we don't know for sure. So there's a bit of a policy a statement in there uh, because we're afraid, in fact, to make a mistake, if you like. There's a, there's a better safe than sorry kind of message there. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of assumptions. Uh, we can may, may talk a little bit later about some of those assumptions and, and why they, most of them are fairly well grounded in science, but not completely. And animal studies, keep in mind, they don't tell us everything. They can tell us a great deal more than any human observational studies about all the effects of a chemical in the animal system. But, uh, but they, they have other disadvantages, the, uh, and this is uh, kind of a key one here. There are also uh, issues, certain health effects, where even the animal model is not all that helpful. Uh, these sort of idiosyncratic reactions that occur sometimes with chemicals, effects on behavior and cognitive development are a little hard to study and translate. Although they are used, lead, lots of lead, uh, infer lead safety evaluations now depend upon certain cognitive deficits related to lead exposure. Although that's mostly from human studies, but it is corroborated in several ways from animal studies. Uh, let me talk a little bit about the decision context. There are sort of two major contexts for decisions. Uh, I'll, I'll go into each of these a little bit. The approach A is where the decision requires only that you, you identify what we call a safe dose, some bright line difference. It's, it's a little phony, as I will explain, but we, we're going to rely upon some bright line difference between safe and unsafe exposures. And for many decisions, that's a very good model and useful to have. The other approach is one where we, for more complex decisions, we would like to understand approach B, how the risk of an adverse effect changes with exposure. And I'll go into the reason why we like to have that approach to, well, what I call the risk per unit of dose. The, the traditional bright line exposure uh, in the food world rests upon what we call the allowable daily intake, the ADI. Uh, many of you know what that is, but it's, it, it is a term used to define that sort of bright line separation between safe and unsafe exposures. It's defined only qualitatively now. Practical certainty of no harm is one term. Likely to be without deleterious effects is another. Uh, we can't say there is no risk associated with an ADI, but we don't quantify it. There are many efforts now underway to quantify risk for, for rather than simply relying on this sort of qualitative statement. But it is used. Uh, we rely upon steps one and two of the risk assessment process. We go through it in detail. There's much emphasis these days on doing more systematic reviews of all of the evidence and arriving at uh, clear pictures of the key hazards, the ones that are most likely to occur at low dose, uh, if you like. And then uh, we put that, a lot of that information we can summarize in dose response curves. Where the, the, we have the risk of toxicity. Notice risk here takes values from zero to one. It's the, it's the fraction of, in this case, say, let's say animals affected in, in any particular study. That's a probability of harm over some period of time versus observed doses where you observe adverse effects. And then you, you, you're focusing on the, the dose at which you see nothing that is different from the control, the so-called no observed adverse effect level. There are other approaches to dealing with that low dose area as well, uh, but I won't go into those now. But that, there's an assumption that there's a threat, that, that represents the NOEL a threshold dose, a dose that needs to be exceeded in whatever animal models were used in the study, 
or in the human study, if you had that, um, the dose that needs to be exceeded the no observed adverse effect level before you run into toxicity. But remember, that's done in some rather relatively small group of experimental animals, animals that are all have all the same genetic backgrounds, they have very good diets, they don't have human diseases, they don't smoke. So, so we expect that on average, there's some good science behind this, that humans on average are going to be more sensitive than, to the effect of a chemical than any animal group of animals like that. So we put in a factor for that greater sensitivity. We do not know what that factor should be. There has been long use of a factor of 10 to go from animals to humans, but the scientific for justification for that is fairly weak. Uh, people are doing a lot of work to try to improve that extrapolation, but in, in cases where you don't know, you use a factor of 10. If you have more specific information, you can use other factors. And then within the human population, there is the issue of variability. Variability is the biggest problem in all of risk assessment population variability in response, and we don't know how big it is. We have some indication, but it's, it is still difficult to pin down. So we use a factor of 10, and you take the Noel and divide. Listen, here, at this stage, you're doing high school chemistry. You have the simple no effect level divided by these factors of 10, and that gives you the ADI. There may be other factors thrown in as well, depending on the database. Uh, this, I'm greatly simplifying what goes on in this process, but basically that's, that's the, the element is to take into account variability in response in some way where you do not have clear scientific evidence. It's expressed as that, I think I, this is a bit of a repeat, a daily dose that can be considered safe. It's not quantified. We don't know how risky it is. We can't claim it's zero because zero is not a scientific idea. But we accept, and this has long been accepted, the ADI as a safe level of intake. Uh, I will say that in the United States, at, uh, and at least if something is a carcinogen, I will go into that, we do not establish ADIs. There are some areas of the world where they are established. Uh, human exposure assessment is the next step. I have only one slide here. This could take up 30 slides. It's a terrific topic. Lots of people working on the area of how to improve our understanding of human exposures through food. And that's particularly difficult. We've got water pinned down, but food is a lot more complicated because intake levels vary much, much more greatly. But we try to come up with something called an estimated daily intake, and our criterion for safety is simply that, that the estimated daily intake. Uh, lots of adjustments in this, uh, the duration, of exposure, duration of intake, all of that has to be taken into account, but that's the basic, simple formula. Uh, that bright line decision works quite well for certain kinds of chemicals, chemicals that are intentionally introduced into food or other parts of the environment. The intentional introduction allows you to say, if it's not safe, you can just remove it. Now, manufacturers may not like that, but it's easy to get rid of it, technically speaking, if, if it doesn't meet the safety criteria. So it's useful for large numbers of decisions involving food additives, pesticides, things of that nature. But there are many important decisions, mostly involving complicated contaminants of food or the environment, uh, that you just cannot will to go away. You just can't easily get rid of them. So you, a more complex risk model is useful for that, where you have technological limitations on your ability to control the exposure. Uh, so this comes out, <clears throat> that model comes out in the cancer risk assessment process. The 70s saw the, this concern I mentioned earlier about carcinogens, and they are real. Uh, the, there was a, there's a great deal of debate about how dangerous they are. But the standard model says they're quite dangerous at very low doses. Uh, they, they, can, they pose risks at all doses, unlike the sort of threshold model. I'll go into that in a little bit. But there are lots of important compounds, not only in food, but in air and water and everywhere in the environment uh, fall into this category. This is uh, one example. Uh, 
a study uh, I was involved in many, many years ago, a small animal study in terms of numbers of animals, but this is what a cancer response looks like, pretty much, uh, where you have dose uh, versus lifetime tumor incidence. These are liver tumors in uh, rats, uh, and you see the rate of tumor uh, incidence increases with dose. The, and, the, and the column on the, on the far right, the lifetime risk, is just simply that probability, uh, and, that, and that can be reflected in a simple dose response curve. This is risk of liver cancer versus dose. That's what aflatoxin looks like, at least in one study. Other studies look different. Studies in mice look different still. <laughs> so you had all that kind of a quantification. Uh, we, the, we look at cancer risk by starting with that dose response curve and then making some assumptions. Some assumptions, let me go back here just a second, that we have a, a no effect level as a starting point or what's often called a point of departure. The human exposure is very, very much lower than anything you can measure in a study like this. But it is assumed that the risk of cancer does not stop just because you can no longer measure it, measure it in a study. The risk of cancer continues all the way down to zero. And it continues all the way down to zero in a straight line manner. This straight line idea came from um, uh, radiation research, uh, which uh, was developed back in the 50s and 60s. And it still holds, at least in the US, there's a great deal of debate about it. No one claims that the low dose risk Here's a very, very low dose risk here in the range of human exposure. These are one in 100,000, one in a million risk levels. No one claims that those are known risks, but they are thought to be at least upper levels, upper limits on risk. The risk could not likely be worse than this. We're not sure what the actual risk is, and it could be zero. But we're going to rely upon that sort of straight line model uh, for expressing the risk. Uh, here's a calculation you do with that slope factor. The slope factor is the risk per unit of dose over a lifetime, cancer risk per unit of dose. And then you just plug in dose, makes it sound simple, and you can produce what's called an upper bound on risk. Upper bound is a statistical upper bound uh, where you would say the lifetime risk here at this exposure level is two in a million approximately in the exposed population. We don't know that that's the true risk, but it's not likely to be greater than that. But we can use it for decisions. That's, a, that's, a, that's how it's used. So the, the value of that kind of model, whether you agree with sort of looking at risk over, over an exposure period, I mean, over different levels of exposure in this linear way makes sense. But it does, it does provide a useful model for looking at how risk changes as exposure changes. And for many decisions, where you're making decisions about the best way to intervene to control exposures, you want an understanding of how risk reduces with different methods of intervention. And make your decision based on that kind of analysis. So it's a more complicated, and it's not a bright line analysis. There are some cancer decisions made on a bright line analysis. At the bottom here, a 10 to the minus 6 lifetime risk is often considered for carcinogens a bright line safe, no, uh, safe, unsafe level. A uh, couple more points, and then I think I'm just about done. Uh, the, there's a lot of emphasis now on looking at mo what are called modes of action for, for toxicity production, looking at all the events beginning with exposure and ending up with some adverse effect at the, at the chemical and biological level to increase understanding. There's a huge amount of work in this area now. And there are even test systems in vitro test systems that have tried to mimic this sort of stepwise process in vitro systems to substitute for animal data where you're looking at a whole series of events um, across uh, this spectrum of, uh, of mechanism. So that's where the future of uh, most toxicology is going. And it's much quicker to do this. You don't have to harm animals. Uh, that's where the future is going. Uh, uncertainty. The most difficult topic that we're not going to talk about much, but uh, if, you, um, if you are not dealing with the uncertainty in the process, then you are lying about your risk. We can be blunt about it. Richard Feynman, the great physicist, said, it's better to live with uncertainty than to believe things that are wrong. And if, if you don't know, if you're not expressing what's uncertain about what you're doing in clear ways, 
because they, they should also influence the decision. So the decision maker has to understand. This is a terrifically difficult challenge. Uh, lots of impediments to risk communication, which is essential to all of this. At all levels of the assessment process, communication is an issue, a problem. Um, so here I just have one slide showing different kinds of problems that arise in, mis in risk communication. One of them relates to the fact that people perceive risks, most people perceive risks in quite different ways from the experts. And it's not like they're stupid, it's just the way the brain works. So some kinds of risks are seen as much more fearful to people than others. And this is a very well-studied area of social psychology. And if you're going to talk to people about risk, you have to understand that. Summation, this is uh, my last slide. I just want to sum, sort of sum up the key points I try to make. Epidemiology evidence is, is available for many important substances, PCBs, dioxins, lead, et cetera, et cetera. But most risk assessments are based on hazard and dose response information from animal studies. We assume now threshold models for all forms of chemical toxicity except cancer. Uh, we don't quantify risk, but we have the sort of qualitative definition of a safe level. Carcinogens are assumed to act through non-threshold mechanisms unless you've got some very convincing evidence that that's not true. Uh, the bright line model is very useful for lots of simple decisions uh, about having a chemical or not, widely used. But the type of risk, quantitative risk model, where you're looking at how risk changes with, with dose or exposure, is more useful for more complicated decisions. Uh, great emphasis now, number six, on mechanistic information. That's where the future of the whole science is moving. And the last one, uh, it, uncertainty is, the, is a great deficit now in the way we express risk results and even when we make decisions. Uh, we need to do much, much better in that area. I think that's probably enough. Thanks. Thank you so much. We have time for We have time for one question because I took a bunch of his time at the beginning. If there's really a burning question, otherwise to say on schedule. Nobody's willing to get you, you explain it so well, they know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, actually, I got one question here real quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, sir. You said you don't do um, ADIs on...